good evening and a happy Wednesday night to you. Grab your hymn book, hymn number 341, Victory in Jesus, is where we're going to start off with tonight. Hymn number 341, I heard an old, old story. It is an old story, but it's new to me. Thank God I'm glad a chance to hear it. Hymn number 341, grab your hymn book, sing with me on that first verse tonight now. I heard it all. Uh, praise God there on the chorus. But I wonder, as you sing about victory, are you happy about it? Yeah, man. I know it's Wednesday night. I wonder if I ask you to raise your hand, how many of you are tired tonight? They got a few of us that are tired. Amen. Welcome to the party. Amen. And uh, hey, we're going to liven it up a little bit on that second verse and say, how's that? Because we're going to smile while we sing. Yeah. Amen. So I heard about his healing, his cleansing power revealing on that second now. I heard about his healing. song leader every now and then he throws a curveball at you so that was all right just strike one you still got two more swings to go thank you for being here tonight and aren't you glad we have victory in jesus amen, amen. it's not through anything else but through jesus christ and oh, i'm so grateful i got a chance to talk today for just a little bit to the man who led me to christ and uh you know just just considering that for a moment and you know one day he would come by knock on my door and as a teenage boy i went from having defeat and failure and sin and hell as my future 
to victory in Jesus. And praise God for that. And uh, thank you for being here tonight. Let's pray. Ask for his blessings upon tonight's service. And uh, boy, we just want the Lord to meet with us once again. And what a great opportunity for us to come together and spend time together with each other, but also time within the Word of God. And uh, let's pray. Ask for his blessings tonight. And uh, Lord, we sure love you. We just thank you so much for your many blessings. And uh, God, just to see things that you've done time and time again your hand at work and God your answered prayer Lord your presence not only with us as we meet together but even as we go through our day God we just thank you I ask that you meet with us again tonight that you stir our hearts with the word of God that you'd help us as we sing and worship and honor you God as we give uh, in the offering Lord may it be a blessing to you Lord, at the invitation, I pray that we'd be able to do business with you, Lord, to kneel down at your feet once again and allow you to draw us to decisions that we need to make that we might better honor you. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. We look forward to what you shall continue to do. We thank you for this church, for members, those you've brought our way. Lord, your continuing work. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated there to kind of give you a couple announcements. Teenagers, don't forget, just right around the corner, not this Saturday, but Saturday after is the youth rally, and we'll be headed to Decatur. And uh, I've got to get some more information as far as uh, scripture memory. I don't know what it is yet, and I don't know what the uh, Bible quiz is. Uh, so as soon as I can find out that information, I will get it to you as soon as possible. So uh, that will be Saturday, uh, uh, May. I'm trying to put us in June or, J or January, one of the two. Uh, Saturday, May 20th, and we will leave here at 1.30 in the afternoon to make it to Decatur on time for the, uh, for the youth rally. So just want to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, also, don't forget, this coming Sunday is... Mother's Day for those who have forgotten and so this coming Sunday's Mother's Day so don't forget that and uh, make sure that you're here that way you might be able to uh, to honor mom and uh, by the way let me just say to to those who's uh, you're not able to attend church uh, maybe with your parents uh, there's some of us uh, our parents won't be in church with us uh, whether they uh, be here or, or in heaven but uh, you know as we stop and just thank God for a mother he said, but my mama wasn't, hey, you're already thinking wrong. He said, but my mom never, nah, you're thinking wrong. You ought to thank God that you had a mother. And uh, there are some of us, and listen, you, you, you might not know who even the lady, the, 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 the lady God used to bring you into this world, but somebody else raised you. It may have been a stepmother or a grandmother, and that was the mother figure in your life. You thank God for that, yes. and that's, that God gave you somebody to call mom. And uh, so just be mindful of that and, uh, you know, just a time on the calendar for us just to stop and think of the blessings of the Lord. I was talking to Brother Stover just a few moments ago and, and uh, you know, just in conversation we're saying, hey, I understand that when, when you get to a certain age in life, every day is a gift. Because you get to a certain age, you don't know if you're going to get another day or not. But the truth is, is at my age, you don't know if you're going to have another day or not. And sometimes, I told Brother Stover, I said, sometimes when it's our age, we forget that. We forget that every day is another gift from God, and we forget about the blessings of God. So don't do that. Just thank God for everything that he's given you. So uh, let me just remind you of that. Also, Wednesday, June 7th, the Bishop family, missionaries to Mindanao, uh, the Philippines, uh, will be our special guest. That's the first Wednesday in June, and uh, you'll want to be here for that. And also, uh, our senior camp is coming up in June, June 19th through the 23rd. Some have been asking me, uh, when, are we gonna, uh, when is the candy going to be here that we can begin to sell? Candy will be here tomorrow. And uh, I, tried, I tried and tried to get it today. That way we might have it, and uh, it did, did not work out. And so uh, we'll, it will be here tomorrow. We'll have dollar bars. And instead of two dollar bars this year, we're going to do the one dollar bars. There's 60 in each box. So for every box you sell, you earn $30 towards your camp. You say, how much is camp? It's $180. Somebody, how many boxes pays for camp? Wow, we have mathematicians in church. Praise the Lord. And uh, so I'm glad it was one of my kids that even said it. I was getting kind of worried. And uh, 6K, you said, that's impossible. Hey, I, let, let, me, let me just encourage you this. I was talking to the, to the bank the other day, and I was telling them about our, our youth going to sell uh, candy. And they said, you know what? Chocolate sells here, too. And so 
I didn't tell you which bank that is, but I just told you it's a bank. And so, uh, you, you know, hey, you mean you, you can just do that? You can just like walk into a business? Listen, if you just take it to them and say, hey, listen, we're trying to raise money for camp. Uh, believe it or not, there's adults in this world that are, that are just amazed that young people are working to earn their way. And, and they will support you just because of the fact you're trying to do it on your own instead of waiting for somebody to pay your way. Right, and so uh, so let me just encourage you to do that. By the way, those that, uh, for camp, uh, it is we are going to a different location than last year. Uh, but let, let me encourage you. Hey, d don't let that sway you one way or the other. I know uh, sometimes as a teenager you think, uh, going somewhere different. Uh, you know, sometimes different is good. And uh, we've, we've done some research, and we've checked out some of the folks that are going there. We know the churches that are going to be there, so it's not different as in we don't know anybody there. We don't know where they stand. We don't know the direction. Uh, we know exactly the direction. They're, they're, they're going to be preaching and teaching. We know exactly the people that are there. Uh, I think there may be one or two pastors that I'm not extremely familiar with, but I'm familiar with all the others. And if I, if I wouldn't send my kids, I wouldn't send your kids. So let me just encourage you with that, that uh, it, 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 it will be a good camp and we'll have a, have a great time. And uh, teenagers, if you, maybe you're a teenager and you're like, well, I don't know if I like going to camp. <clears throat> Parents, let me just say this. When I got saved at 16 years old, youth pastor came by and picked me up. He said, I'd like to see if you spend the afternoon with me. I've got some errands to run. I said, okay. I thought that was weird. But he picked me up, and he was running around. I don't remember what, what the errands were, but he said to me this. He said, I've got a, I've got a scholar. He said, or first he asked me, he said, are you going to camp? I said, I, I don't think so. I, I can't come up with that kind of money. He said, well, I have a scholarship. Took my excuse right out the, out the window. I mean, just threw it out the door. And I said, well, um, I don't know if I can get off of work. He said, have you asked? Well, no, sir. He said, well, why don't you ask? Well, I work in a certain position. It's hard to get somebody to fill our position. He said, have you asked? And he was on me just about it. And I was thinking, I don't want to go to camp. Why would I want to go to camp? Church camp at that. Well, I mean, what are they going to do at church camp? I mean, that was my mind. I'd just been saved just a couple months. I'd been to Sunday school and Sunday morning service and Sunday evening. And I'm thinking, I've, I've gone to church all week, church? No, thank you. No way. I won't fit in. Not at all. And so... Uh, I went to, uh, I, but because my youth pastor asked me to do so, I did. I went to uh, work, and, uh, and I knew for sure the guys, there was only three, three men or three young men at the time that held this same position. So if I was out, the other two had to fill in all my shifts, and I knew they never filled in for me for anything. I mean, it didn't matter what it was. I could have died, and they wouldn't have filled in my, my spot. And uh, so I went to them that week, and I said, hey, I, I knew for sure the answer was no, but I was going to ask so I can go back and say I can't go. I said, hey, could you fill in for me during the next week if I went out of town? Sure. <laughs> I got one more chance. I went to the other guy. I said, hey, can you fill in for those where he can't fill in? Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> that is wrong. That is wrong, wrong, wrong. I'm thinking the Lord is playing a cruel joke on me. He's going to make me. And so then I thought, I got one last chance. I got to ask my parents. And I, I told my youth pastors, well, I got work figured out. They'll, they'll do it, but I don't think my parents will let me go. He said, why not? I said, my dad's going out of town. He said, well, have you asked? <laughs> no, I will. And so I went and I talked to my mom. I said, mom, uh, dad's going out of town, uh, but camp's coming up. Uh, Brother Davis wants to know if I can go. Sure thinking no she did not just say yes <laughs> she never does that and so and uh, yeah never they never I never got just do anything in life and now they've sending me to church camp and I thought oh my uh, this is horrible so I went and, and had no idea we drove nine hours down to comfort Texas in the hill country it was hot there's rocks everywhere I mean the hills everywhere you had to climb a hundred steps to get to the chapel I mean 120 some odd steps I mean I'm talking about legs burning I mean unless you were brother Chad you couldn't make it up without stopping and uh, it, I mean they had a platform halfway up to kind of rest and, and another platform up for the basketball courts and, and you'd stop there and and, and then when the girls came up behind you, you had to keep going because you didn't want them to pass you. I mean, that, that was embarrassing. And uh, so uh, I remember I, I went to church camp that year for the very first time. I didn't know what to expect. It was no air conditioning. No, I mean, it was, it was hot, too. And God began to work in my heart. I came home, and, I, and just, just testimony of this, when I walked in the front door, my mom said, 
She shook her head. She's like, yep. She said, you're glowing. And I said, what? She said, God did something to you, didn't he? Now, she wasn't in church. But she looked at me and she said, this week did something to you. You wouldn't want to take that away from your kids, would you? Now, maybe your teenager doesn't want to go. Looking at some teenagers here. Melissa, I'll count you in, but you can still make it to camp. We can use we can use some adult help. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can go. Isaiah? Yeah. Hey, come on. Y'all can y'all can still go. Yeah, we'll put you to work. Amen. Have you asked? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Got a couple more teenagers here and two more there and let's see. There's there's none. A teenager in the very back? Oh, they're right back here. Right back over there. Yeah. There's a teenager. She's been asking about going. Yeah. Hey, listen. And by the way, uh, adults can go. Adults can go. We, we can use the help for one. But number two, I, I promise you every year God works in the hearts of adults who go to camp. It's not just for the kids. Man, my heart gets stirred. I mean, I'm excited about camp. And I'm really looking forward to this camp. Uh, uh, Dr. Bob Gray Jr. will be preaching uh, for those that know him. Pastors Longview Baptist Temple in uh, Longview, Texas, obviously, and uh, uh, also president of the, of the, the college that's out there. Uh, but uh, he'll be preaching. I'm looking forward to spending some time with some good preachers. Uh, how many of you remember Brother J.D. Weedo that, that has come? Brother Weedo, him, him, his church will be there. He's kind of the senior pastor of the group, and uh, he's the one we look to for spiritual guidance. And, and uh, well, us younger guys, you know, we, we know how to hit, you know, footballs and, and you know, all, ramrod all the games and stuff like that. Or, and I'm looking forward to, hey, at this camp they have a rifle range. You say, well, they got a rifle range at camp? Yeah. Hey, it's pretty sad that young men don't know how to fire a weapon. And then if they had to aim it, <laughs> stand right back behind them the whole time, right? And so I also got an archery range, and hey, those things are good. But I, I will say this, the very first year that these, these churches met uh, for camp, the very first year they met, they had some ladies begin to sing uh, before the church uh, service uh, one night, and it was about a Wednesday night. And uh, before the preaching ever began, the Holy Spirit of God broke loose. And folks were hitting the altar. I mean, decision after decision. I think for two and a half hours, they asked those young ladies to sing. Because they were still just, I mean, folks hitting the altar. You said, but there was no preaching. God took care of that. That song, the music, was preaching to the hearts of those young people. And there was great decisions made that week. And uh, so you say, you mean that kind of, that kind of stuff really happens? Yes. Sure does. So I'm looking forward to camp. And so if you if you uh, if you can go and like to go and would like to sell some candy, and uh, we'll have that available tomorrow. And make sure to uh, let me know when you want it and, and how you want it and so on and so forth. And we'll help you to sell. Also, when the Matthews don't know this yet, when they get back in the town, being the youth instructors that they are, if they watch us online before they get back in the town, they'll find out. And we're going to ask them to help some teenagers by maybe establishing a table or two at Walmart and take some teenagers and let them just get rid of all the candy as soon as possible because I don't need it in my office. And uh, I, I don't need it. <laughs> I don't want to eat it no more. And so looking forward to that. What's that? Oh, it's good. I'll have to. That's tomorrow. I'll get to make make way for it. Yes, sir. Yeah. So hymn number 302. Take a hymn book there. Hymn number 302. It's wonderful to be a Christian. Hymn number 302. 302. Grab your hymn book. Sing with me on that first verse now. Life is purpose now and never had before. There is meaning to be standing alone. For a joy and peace I can't explain is mine. Since I found her life in Christ, what would be mine? Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be a child. Oh, it is wonderful to have a Christ to be a Oh, it is wonderful. Christian tonight? Amen. I hope you
you all. Let me hear you on that second now. Oh, I can go directly to the Lord and pray. for just a moment we'll sing that third verse wonderful to be
wonderful to be a Christian, isn't it? And uh, praise the Lord. And I'm glad to know that I am one. And, uh, you know, it's not only good to be able to call yourself a Christian, it's good when you can live life in such a way where somebody else calls you a Christian. Amen. Yeah, he said, does that ever happen? Oh, yeah. Now, sometimes they don't say it in a very kind way. <laughs> but that's okay. I'd rather them know where I stand. And uh, through Jesus Christ. So, well, it's offering time now. Let's ask those blessings upon the, the offering. And uh, looking forward to uh, seeing how God continues to use our offerings. A joy to be able to take on a new missionary uh, last week. Uh, missionaries to Japan. And, and I was encouraged. In fact, they didn't have a meeting on Sunday night. And they decided to come back here. Of all the places they could go. And uh, by the way, for those that uh, don't know, they're from Southwest Baptist Church in Oklahoma City. Now, some folks don't know much about that church. Maybe you do not. Very large church. Uh, a church that uh, is uh, a core part of the Heartland Baptist Bible College. And um, it's known also for the, the music uh, in the church. They, they sing out. And uh, our missionary guests, they turned around and they said, they knew they was a small church, but they said they felt like they were back at home. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's, that's an, encourage, an encouragement when uh, somebody from a church probably 10 times our, or more than 10 times our size, uh, you know, yeah, how many times? 20 to 30 times. <laughs> 2,000, okay, yeah, I, I didn't know how much total, yeah, 2,000 people. And they said they came here and felt like they were at home. That's a blessing. And uh, not only because of how you sing, but the friendliness and also where we stand. Amen. So you don't understand missionaries go out, the field, on the, out in the field and they find all kinds of churches. And just because it says Baptist on the sign doesn't mean it's necessarily on the inside, right? <laughs> Anybody ever bought something that said, J just like name brand? <laughs> yeah, it didn't taste like it though, right? <laughs> Amen. Just because it says it on the box doesn't mean the inside is. And so uh, grateful that uh, they came uh, back and so looking forward to how God will continue to use the offerings of Victory Baptist Church. Thomas, I ask the Lord to bless our offering, please, sir, tonight. <laughs> possible with God. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. I do, and thank God for it. Well, that opportunity now. Anybody have any answered prayer this week? Any answered prayer? Miss Jessica. Wow, what a blessing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And uh, That's good. <laughs> i got to be able to talk now. <laughs> Amen. You know, children are precious, and to see them go through health struggles is difficult. And uh, to see God do miraculous things. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Miss Monty. Amen. Amen. And she said the pay is even a little better. Amen. <laughs> Closer and more pay. And I just thank God for keeping you and me good deal. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord for that. Good to hear that. Uh, Miss Joyce. Uh, ben Morgan that's on our prayer list, the two year old from Kenya. Mm -hmm. I haven't officially put him in studies in remission 
Really well. Amen. Praise the Lord. So looking forward to when they officially put them in. And, and uh, leukemia is very difficult. And so praise the Lord for, for that. And hopefully this will be something. Go on remission. He'll never have to deal with it again. Amen. Praise God. And uh, Brother Stover. Amen. Let me tell what you said earlier. Brother Stover said he had to take uh, Mrs. Stover yesterday to to Dallas. She wasn't doing very well, but they were able to, to help her, and uh, and she's doing much better today, a much better day, and so things are looking upward. That's good. And so, thank God for that. That's what we were talking about earlier, and thank God for that. Thank you, Brother Stover, for letting us know. Anybody else to that answer to prayer? Brother Kretzinger. You and I talked. Amen. For her job. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And we've been praying for Brother Kretzinger to find some work. And uh, when the phone rings and somebody says, can you work? That's a blessing, isn't it? Amen. And uh, thank God for that. And uh, I told you, God answers prayer. And I knew he's going to. And uh, so we're trusting. Keep praying. Hadn't got a start date yet, but hopefully very soon. Yep. Very, very soon. And thank God for that. Amen. Anybody else? Ethan, do you have an answer to prayer? Oh, okay. You're just hand up with that. And uh, Miss Karen. Yeah, my uh, niece that lives in Ameline that has the, uh, her son had the helmet. Mm -hmm. they taking him off the helmet. Everything's fine. He'll need no more. Just when he rides his bicycle and things like that, he'll need his helmet. But otherwise, he's doing fine. Amen. And we just, I just learned today that her husband has been deployed. Don't know where. Wow. But several people from Dryas Air Force Base have been deployed. Okay. Well, so, keep a lot of things in the news going on for sure and a lot of things we don't know about as well. So pray for those that are out there in harm's way on our behalf. For sure. Yeah, let's see. Did I miss anybody? Any answered prayer tonight? And I uh, want to make sure I didn't miss anybody. Had a couple, uh, personally, a couple of unspoken uh, met this, this week. And uh, seeing God just work in a couple miraculous ways, and uh, they're unspoken, but I know what they are. The Lord knows what they are, and something we've been praying about uh, for for a great period of time. And so, thank God for that. And then, uh, uh, I guess, let's see, where did Trey go? There you are. Uh, since you won't say it, I'll say it. Trey, uh, our family at one point was just talking about uh, meeting a, a, a a uh, vacation in Branson with all the family in November uh, instead of you know meeting it together for Thanksgiving meet somewhere local so that way the the family that lives up north and the family that leave, lives out east we can all converge in one location well that didn't all pan out and the kids were kind of bummed about that because they were wanting to go to Branson and and uh, so uh, evidently Trey was still praying about that and so uh, my wife received word this past week of a, a family, a pastor in New Mexico that had planned a trip to Branson with their family and things fell through. They are now going to Florida. They called for a refund. They said no refund. They said we need someone to go and use this because otherwise it's just going to waste. Can anybody use it? <laughs> well... <laughs> And uh, so dates were already pre-planned, pre-set, but, uh, you know, if, especially for a large family, the most expensive thing is lodging, right? And uh, so you said, what are you going to do in Branson? I, I don't know. We, we might do a couple things, but we might do nothing. And, uh, you know, praise the Lord for that. And uh, so n next week we will be headed out of town, uh, actually at the end of this week, and uh, a very unexpected thing just kind of falls in your lap. And uh, here, let me kind of tell you how the Lord works, too. Uh, the kids have a friend up in Jefferson City, Missouri, who is graduating high school, and they sent a graduation invitation. And the uh, kids said, can, uh, can, can we go? And I was like, that's, I don't know, that's a long way to go. Uh, well, it just so happens it's this weekend as well. And we're going to be in Branson anyways. And so we're only about two and a half hours away. And so the kids are like, so we can go now? No. And uh, no. <laughs> We get to go, and uh, so that'll be a joy. Uh, for those teenagers that met Brother Randy Dignan, it's uh, his daughter, and uh, it, we, we have the opportunity now to go to his church in Jefferson City, Missouri. And uh, for those of you who don't know him, a great, compassionate preacher, uh, also uh, the only hearing person in his family. And so he speaks fluent sign language, if you can speak it. And uh, 
And so when he preaches, he signs at the same time. And so it's amazing how God's used that to produce a great deaf ministry in Jefferson City, Missouri. And so we'll have the opportunity to be there. He says, so that means we don't come to church on Sunday? No, you be here on Sunday. By the way, have a camera now recording. So when you're not walking by, I know you were not here. And uh, so uh, not just the audio recording. See, there, uh, noggin's working. Uh, Brother and Mrs. Wade will be here on Sunday, and we look forward to having them in. And so they'll be able to uh, fill in. So there will be somebody on the piano on, on Sunday. Praise God for that, right? So when you, can you imagine singing Acapulco style? Some of you can, and uh, so, but uh, that's an answer to a prayer. Trey was praying for it, and uh, so y'all pray for us as we uh, make some travels, and uh, obviously we want to come back home safe and sound. Let me give you a few uh, prayer requests to put on your prayer list, if you will. Uh, Ms. Kretzinger asks we pray for uh, her uncle. His name is Robert Janita. And don't think that's confusing. That's, that's his name, and uh, so... Robert Janita, and uh, he had a fainting spell last week. He can't remember what happened. Uh, he's been diagnosed with early stages of dementia. So if you'll be in prayer for Robert Janita, Miss Kretzinger's uncle. Uh, Miss Pallia is asking we pray for her dad, Harold Cook. He's in uh, Denton Presby uh, waiting on a bone marrow biopsy test results. And so uh, is that to see, uh, f to receive a transplant or for... Do a boss. Okay. So pray for him. Uh, I know anything dealing with bone marrow, that's a lot of pain too. So if you would pray for Harold Cook and uh, Miss Pye, you would appreciate that. And uh, Miss Singleton asked that we pray for uh, her nephew, Kenny Stout. <coughs> Kenny Stout. And uh, Kenny has cancer and also multiple infections that he's dealing with. And so if you would be in prayer. Uh, for him and then my wife has a couple she's not able to fill out a card since she's playing the piano <laughs> so she'll have to let me know what those are um, Christine's student asked that we pray for her mom specifically they think she has problems when she's sleeping a lot she's got a lot of other health issues going on but it being so far away from the seeds she's, she's Christine's upset she can't be with her so you know, pray for the seeds and that but also pray for the mother <clears throat> And then also Ms. Raspberry asked that we pray for Brother Raspberry's mom, her mother-in-law. They just found out, she was told she did not have cancer in her thyroid, but now they said that it is in her thyroid and also in her lung. And she said this is her fourth cancer in five years. Wow. So she's very discouraged and obviously, you know, obviously that comes along with that diagnosis, so they asked that we pray for her. So that's Ms. Pat Raspberry. Pat Raspberry, yes. So if you're not able to hear that, pray for Miss Christine Steed's mom, uh, health problems, possible Crohn's disease, and then Miss Pat Raspberry with cancer. And um, of course, multiple cancers through many years. That's not, that doesn't bring a lot of favor to how you think things are going to turn out. And so if you'd be in prayer for these ladies, if you would. And then can... I ask that you just uh, continue to pray. We've been asking uh, for, for weeks now uh, to continue to pray for a few individuals. Continue to pray for Mr. Leon Stogsdale. He's on the prayer list. And uh, just continue to pray for his recovery and uh, our opportunity to, to be a witness to him, uh, to be able to ensure his salvation. And then continue to pray for Brother Tim Morrow as uh, his back still dealing with that issue. Uh, his soonest appointment to see the doctor again is going to be next Monday. And so pray for him as, as try to wait till that appointment just to find out what we can do. So. Yeah, and uh, she's been having some ups and downs, I think, right? And uh, different uh, suggestions from doctors on some things to, to, to help, but uh, she just needs, needs God's intervention to help. Amen. Yes, sir. And so continue to remember that. Oh. Yeah. So be in prayer for these needs, if you will, and uh, thank God for answered prayer. And uh, appreciate those men that were here Monday night at 6 o'clock for prayer meeting. And uh, we had a great time together. Uh, great opportunity to pray. And uh, 
you know, the J James said we have not because we ask not. And so grateful when we get a chance to ask together unto the Lord. Well, take a hymn, but one last song tonight. Hymn number 393. Think about the day you see Jesus face to face. Hymn number 393. When you see his face, you'll wish you'd given him more. So 393. Sing unto the Lord on that first now. can be seated there and looking forward to that day we do see Jesus face to face and we will at that time wish we had given him more that I promise and especially after all he's done for us well take your Bible tonight to Philippians chapter 3 Philippians chapter 3 we finally made it out of chapter 1 and chapter 2 and we get into a new chapter tonight it's Philippians chapter 3 and uh, as we begin with Philippians chapter 3, tonight we'll probably both see introduction to the chapter and maybe yeah, a little bit into the, up to the second verse. And I don't think we'll get much past that, but uh, hopefully it'll be a help to you this evening. Philippians chapter 3. What's the theme of the book of Philippians? Joy. joy. The, the kids sing a song. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my Oh, that was horrible. Down in my heart. That's a little bit better, right? Do you have the joy tonight? Yes. Listen, there's nothing like knowing Jesus Christ, is there? There's nothing like knowing Him as your Savior and knowing that He's with you and walking with you and, and holding on to His Word. And, and as we've been going through the book of Philippians, I hope that you've been taking these principles and things that we've been learning and been applying them to your life in such a way that you begin to watch your joy increase. Jesus said that He came that you might have joy and that your joy might be full, right? 
How many Christians walking around in half-empty tanks of joy? Right? Or, I wonder how many of you have been on the side of the road one time with a car where you forgot to look at the needle. Or you had a teenager that forgot to look for you. Yeah. You ever been there? Hey, and realize that by the time you notice it, it's too late, and you're on the side of the road looking for fuel and calling for help. And can I say that many times in our Christian life, that's what happens to us. Our joy tank is empty in a circumstance or, or a certain person or a certain situation or uh, things come into our life that causes us to lose our joy so much that we end up as a Christian on the side of the road broken down. That's not where you want to be. Paul's addressing this thing to the, to the church and he's uh, speaking to them and, and hopefully you remember as we've been going through the book of Philippians and talking about this joy, he's not just talking about a joy or a happiness that you have because you have possessions, but listen, he's, he's specifically addressing certain frames of the mind which will cause you to have joy. That means if you can't get your thinking right, guess what you're not going to have? Joy. So let's... Look here, chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and now let's read a portion of this chapter together, and then we'll kind of jump into, uh, once again, talking about the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, begin reading verse 1 with me. Paul says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath uh, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith." that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though it had already attained, either were already perfect, but I followed after, if that I may apprehend, uh, may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count my, not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything, uh, uh, if anything ye be otherwise minded, or, or excuse me, if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us, uh, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have, uh, as you have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is, is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, there's a lot of things in chapter 3 going on in there. And as we read that, we're going to focus on just kind of the beginning of chapter 3. But, but I want you to, to notice uh, as we begin tonight in, in, into this next chapter, notice verse 8. Paul says, yea, doubtless I count all, what's that next word? Things. What things? All things. I count all things but loss for the excellency 
of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. As we begin the study of Philippians, we told you there's some joy killers in life. Sometimes it's the circumstances you go through. You ever been in a circumstance that killed your joy? Paul dealt with that in chapter 1. He said, what's going to help you? Hey, in my circumstance that he's describing, with him being incarcerated, with him fixing to lose his life, in the circumstance he was in, Paul decided he was going to have a single mind, and it dealt with the gospel. Because of the fellowship of the gospel and the furtherance of the gospel and the faith of the gospel, he can say, you know what? My circumstance is not going to overcome me. I can still have joy. Sometimes the joy killer is not a circumstance. Sometimes it's people. That's where it gets real quiet, doesn't it? You ever had somebody cause you to lose your joy? Paul deals with that in chapter 2. Hey, there's a couple of ladies in the church that are kind of arguing with each other, and he kind of uses that as an example. Hey, listen, it should not be people that destroy our joy. What's going to help me with that? Well, we've got to have a submissive mind. We've got to learn to follow the examples of Jesus and Paul and Timothy, and even we talked about Epaphroditus. Chapter 3, he's going to deal with the third joy killer. You say, what's that? Sometimes it's not circumstances. Sometimes it's not people. But sometimes it's just things. So what do you mean? You ever had somebody ask you, what's wrong? And you say, nothing. <laughs> By the way, men, when she says that with the emphatic thing, you're in trouble. <laughs> what's wrong? Nothing. No thing. You ever have something cause you to lose your joy? We're going to talk about that beginning in chapter 3 here. Lord, we just ask you to help us tonight as we continue our study through the book of Philippians. And Lord, we, if we are all honest with ourselves, there has been times where our circumstances have caused us to lose, lose our joy. People have caused us to lose our joy. And sometimes it's things, things of this world that cause us to lose our joy. Uh, tonight, would you speak to our hearts and help us to examine what things draw us away from you and what things draw us towards you? Help us to be mindful of those things uh, that we might protect ourselves from losing our joy for the wrong things, the wrong reasons. I ask as we continue to do this study, you use it to further your gospel. Help us to reach the lost, fulfill your great commission, strengthen and edify the church, and most of all, that we might glorify you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You say, preacher, okay, so I'm supposed to have the single mind to help overcome my circumstances. I'm supposed to have the, the submissive mind to help me to overcome people in life. Chapter 3, how in the world do, do, do I have, uh, how am I able to overcome certain things that cause me to lose my joy? Paul's going to begin to deal with what we're going to call tonight a spiritual mind. Not just a, a, a single mind thinking about the gospel, not just a submissive mind, not, not, uh, not putting myself above others, but now, hey, we're going to deal specifically with our hearts and our lives and, and have a spiritual mind. Paul would use in chapter 3 the word thing or things 11 different times. And, and sometimes we just kind of pass by that. Hey, notice also we find in this chapter Paul's going to describe, he's going to begin with his past, he's going to talk about his present, and he's going to conclude with his future in Christ. With this in mind, we can almost break this chapter up if you want to uh, kind of see where we're going to go over the next number of weeks. I don't know what that number is. There's three different sections that you can divide this chapter in. Verses 1 through 11, Paul almost describes his past as though he was an accountant. He says, I count all things but loss. And he's looking up at his past righteousness and he says it adds up to nothing. In chapters, or verses 12 through 16, Paul describes his present condition as though he was an athlete. He says, I press towards the mark, in verse 14, of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Hey, in Christ, he's given, been given a new vigor in life. And then Paul describes his future in verses 17 through 21. And, and he reminds us that we're not of this world. So he's almost describing himself, hey, not as just an accountant and, and not just as an uh, athlete, but understand the definition of the word, an alien, just because it starts with letter A. 
foreign. You realize we're not of this world. Hey, the Bible says we're seated together with God in heavenly places. The Bible says, hey, we're just pilgrims sojourning through a land. Hey, I am a citizen of heaven first and foremost. And he says we look in verse 20, looking towards that future, a new vision in life. In chapter 3 here, he begins to describe even those who are just mindful of earthly things in verse 19. The word mindful or to mind earthly things, he says they're inclined to or they tend to earthly things. Look with me again in verse 18. He said, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the, notice, enemies of the cross of Christ. Have you ever heard anybody make this statement? I'm going to make it. Yeah, I can make it. All right. You ever heard anybody make this statement? Hey, we're all just children of God. What does the Bible say? Paul's saying they are enemies of Christ. That doesn't sound like a child of God to me. He says they're enemies of Christ. You say, well, wait a minute. Everybody's not going to heaven? No. We find example of that in Scripture. If everybody went to heaven just because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, why did Jesus tell us the story of a man perishing and going to hell? Because not everybody, why did Jesus tell us that there will be many who will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done? And they fill in all the blanks of all the things they've done. And he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. If everybody doesn't go to heaven, then why does Jesus tell us that? Because everybody doesn't go to heaven. And can I also say this? Just because they're in the quote unquote religious world or even the Christian world doesn't mean they're partakers of the cross. There are some who are, Paul said, enemies of the cross. How, 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 do you, how do you tell some of these enemies? Well, he's beginning to describe some of that. Notice again, verse 19, whose end is destruction and whose God is their belly. What do you mean their belly? You ever heard this question? What's in it for me? Yeah. How many folks serve God only for what's in it for them? How many folks, quote unquote, in spiritual leadership, pastors behind the pulpit, staff in the church, deacons in the church, or whatever position you want to give a man, listen, the only reason they go for that position is so they can have power and authority. It's all about them. He said, whose God is their belly. And look what he says. And whose glory is in their shame. Well, that doesn't speak well of them. Shame on them to try to take the glory away from Jesus Christ. Can I say, there is nothing. Paul says, in me that, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Listen, what he's saying. Anything good that I ever do is not me, but it's Christ doing it through me. He's the one that deserves the honor. He's the one that deserves the glory. Without him, I can do nothing. How do you know that? Because Jesus said that. Without him, I can do nothing. And notice he says there at the end of verse 19, he says, speaking of those who are enemies of the cross, who mind Earthly, what's that last word? Things. Huh. Things. He said, preachers, things cause me to lose my joy. What, what's he talking about? Earthly things. Notice verse 20. He says, but for our conversation or what our life speaks, listen, is in heaven. You ought to be identified just by the way you live with a, that you are a citizen of heaven. When someone looks at you and watches you and listens how you talk and what you talk about and the places you go and the decisions you make, listen, you ought to identify more with a citizen of heaven. And, and listen, understand where I, where I stand here, more than even a citizen of the United States of America. I love this flag. And it, somebody has asked me before, hey, if you ever had to, had to bleed or give your life for this flag as a Christian, would you? Yes, I would. Yes, I would. 
I would stand up for that flag and I would stand up for this nation and I would serve her proudly. And, and I'm not saying pri uh, proudly as in a prideful sense as though we're better than everybody else and the prideful of Satan. Listen, I, as though I'm talking about proudly as though I'm understanding the blessings God has given us by allowing us to be Americans. But can I say as Americans, sometimes we'll stand for this flag more than we'll stand for this flag. This flag, listen, represents the, all that we are. The fact that Jesus Christ died for us and forgave us our sins and gave us a home in heaven. And my friend, when this flag falls, hey, this flag's still going to stand. Hey, when this flag turns its heart against God, this flag is still what I represent. When this flag and the people that, that, that stand in this nation, when they refuse to, to follow God and refuse to follow the word of God, hey, I'm supposed to identify the listen. I'm thankful God's allowed me to be an American, but I'm first and foremost a Christian. Paul says that your conversation, listen, is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're to be minding heavenly things. You say, what are you saying, preacher? Are things bad? Not in and of themselves, no. As a matter of fact, notice this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, Be not therefore like unto uh, them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask Him. Your Father knoweth what? What things. So wait a minute. As Jesus is talking about the Lord knowing what things you have need of, are those things bad? No. Notice this. He said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? Amen. Good things. You mean there's good things and there's bad things? Oh, yeah. You've seen good things. You've seen bad things. Things is just a general term, isn't it? Yeah. And sometimes it's certain things that draw our hearts away from God. Or it could be certain things that draw us closer to God. Imagine what Jesus said there. If you, being evil, and some people already read that verse and they get all the feathers in a ruffle. I'm not evil. You're a sinner. Tell me when sin was not evil. Right? You said, I can't believe he just looked at us and just called us sinners. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm a sinner too. And hey, listen, if I do always what this flesh wants, you realize that I'm going to choose me over anything else. Right? Listen, dads, no matter how wonderful a dad you are, when you get in the flesh, are you concerned more about the kids or more about you? You say, what do you mean? Let me help you here. Guilty, by the way. I'll just let you know. Guilty. 3 a.m. You've got that child that just maybe weeks, days, or even months old. And, and there's a cry coming from the other bedroom. Right? By the way, who normally gets up first for that? Normally. I'm not saying all the time, but normally who gets up? Mama. Mama. You know what dad does? Hey, can we be honest? Sometimes you heard it. But you just think, if I just stay asleep, she'll take care of the kid. Some of you are laughing because you know what I'm talking about, right? If, if I just keep my eyes closed, and listen, you, I mean, you're dreaming and everything, and, and you, you really haven't woken up yet, but in the back of your mind, there's a little bit of consciousness coming too, and if I just stay asleep, she'll take care of the kid. And when she finally gets up with those blankets coming halfway off the bed, woof, and uh, fine, I'll take care of it. And you're all boom, boom, boom. And you're like, oh, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> but guess what? You don't care because you're going back to sleep. <laughs> you say, what are you talking about? Listen, that when you're asleep, you know you're not thinking of spiritual things. Man, I'm tired. I'm worn out. And, and how many of us, listen, in those situations you say, but you just don't know how tired I am. Since one, the spiritual decisions matter how tired you are. Yep. Right? And by the way, hey, moms and dads, you ever realize that the needs of our children, they don't always come when you're full of energy. Do they? Hey, the needs of the kids don't always come when the pocketbook's all of a sudden full. 
The needs of the kids don't always come when, when everything's right. It always comes at a bad time, doesn't it? Yeah. Always. And Jesus said, if you being evil, now you understand a little bit more, don't you? Yet, even as evil as we are, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? Now, here's the caveat. You said, I knew there was going to be one. <laughs> we are to grow as Christians to be able to know the difference between earthly things that we think will bring us joy, yet they never do, and heavenly things that truly bring us joy. You say, what do you mean? So in Matthew 7, 11, when Jesus is talking about the Heavenly Father giving good things to them that ask Him, you know, He gives a little bit more insight, or, or should I say Luke gives us a little bit more insight in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, where He tells us about the same conversation. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, it's stated this way, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. Amen. Would you say the Holy Spirit's a good thing? Yes. And see, here's our problem. We think, oh, God's going to give me good things. and Oh, wow, I'm thinking of a boat, and, and I'm thinking of a lake house, and I'm thinking of a, uh, I'm thinking of a better job and, and a, bigger, uh, a b better car, one that actually starts. And, and hey, I, I'm thinking, and you start thinking of those things, and yet when Jesus, hey, listen, through Luke, tells us a little bit more details, he's not talking about those things that burn up. He said the Holy Spirit. That's a little different, isn't it? And see, here's our problem. Our mind goes to things of this world instead of things that be of heaven. There ought to be a difference. Hey, good things are not, uh, are not things that draw us further from God, but they draw us closer to God. Let me give you a few practical examples of some things that I'm talking about. You ever known somebody that prayed for a better job? Not just a job, but a better job. They had one, but there was just something about it that, you know what, maybe you wanted more income, better hours, whatever, and you're praying for a better job. And you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and all of a sudden, hey, this offer comes. Hey, can I just remind you that everything sometimes when it looks like an answer to prayer, everything that you think is an answer to prayer might not necessarily be an answer to prayer. Amen. Right? He said, what do you mean? I prayed for a better job. God gave it to me. Yeah, but you're working on Sunday now. But there's more income, and, and I can be home more, uh, earlier in the evenings, and I can do this. And yeah, but all of a sudden now, you can't serve God. You see? Let me ask you a question. Who doesn't want you in church on Sunday? Yeah. Can I remind you? Sometimes, here's how we pray. As we bow our knees, we say out loud, Lord, would you please, and we say in church, hey, would you pray for this need? And we come to men's prayer meeting and we pray out loud. You know, God's not the only one who hears when you pray out loud. Satan says, oh, he wants a better job, huh? I've got a plan for him. I've got a job for him. And all of a sudden, this job pulls us away from our service from the, for the Lord. And, and, and you sit down. And, and listen, how, how many times have men sat down with a pastor and said, Hey, preacher, I want you to pray about me with this. Hey, I got this job offer. And, and, and I'm thinking about it. And the pastor starts asking questions. And the pastor says, Yeah, I don't know about that. And he takes the job. And six months later... The marriage is falling apart. Hey, they're out of church. Hey, everything is going downhill. Things. How about this? You didn't just pray for a better job, but maybe you were praying specifically for better income. Better income. Can anybody use an extra few hundred dollars a month? <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Hey, everybody would use that. And listen, it doesn't matter. Can I, can I remind you? It doesn't matter how much you make. You could always use more. I mean, if your salary doubled today, I promise you in about three or four years, you could use some more. Because we live on a certain level based upon our income, don't we? When the income goes up, our needs just happen to go up, don't they? 
Huh. You prayed for that extra job or, or for that extra income. And that extra income produces more toys and more hobbies. And I'm not against toys and I'm not against hobbies. How many of you ever noticed the difference between a man and a boy or the price of his toys? <laughs> right? Hey, there's nothing wrong with toys and hobbies. They're not bad until all of a sudden that because of the toys and because of the hobbies, listen, it means we go months and months without a presence in church or we drop out of church altogether. Or listen, all of a sudden, I love to hunt, but all of a sudden hunting is more important to us than, than, than attending church. And all of a sudden now it's better to be on. Well, I can only go fishing on the weekend. And I bought that boat and it would be dishonest to God for him to give me that money to buy a boat and I don't take it out and say, Saturdays, I'm busy mowing the yard, so I've got to take it out on Sunday. We rationalize it, don't we? Now, all of a sudden, things that we prayed for drew us away from God. Can I just remind you, things are either going to push you towards God, or they're going to draw you away from God. In Luke chapter 12, we find a parable that Jesus gives us, and we usually focus on the fool in this parable whose soul is not ready for eternity, and rightfully so. Yet I want you to notice the context of this parable that Jesus gave. In Luke chapter 12, verse 13, uh, forward there, the Bible says, And uh, one of the company said unto him to Jesus, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. What's the inheritance? <coughs> Things. Things that you get when mom or dad are no longer around, right? They've been befallen. To think, you didn't earn them. It's not that you deserve them. It's, hey, mom and dad lived their life in such a way that they saved this up, and now that they're gone, they've decided to disperse it amongst the children, right? And so here's this, inherit, here's this brother saying, Master, Jesus, will you tell him to give me what belongs to me? Right? Imagine that. And, and notice what Jesus said. Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? By the way, if we can't let him control everything in our life, why does he all of a sudden got to control this? You understand? You don't come to me for anything else, but now all of a sudden because you want something, because you quote unquote deserve it, it's yours. Now you come to me? You understand what Jesus is saying here? And look what he said. Verse 15, he said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Hey, it doesn't matter how many things you have, death still comes to us all. To illustrate, he gives us the parable, saying, A ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And Jesus said, And I will say unto, uh, or he, the man says, And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be? which thou hast provided. Jesus is giving a warning. Hey, say, he's saying, hey man, you're more worried about things than you are your relationship with God. There's more in life than things. Amen? And yet, when do things cause us to lose our joy? Maybe it's not a circumstance or some person, but maybe it's something that's stolen your joy or the joy of the Lord from your heart, which the Bible says is your strength. And now your strength is small and you desire to quit in the day of, of adversity because of some thing. Paul's about to start comparing his earthly things with those of others in chapter 3. Notice again in verse 4, he said, though, uh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any, other, uh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. What he's saying is, listen, you, you might think that there's some things in your life that make you better than others. And he say, listen, I've got you all beat. You're like, well, that's a kind of a prideful statement. 
You see, you've got to follow the rest of the context. He's saying, listen, he gets to the end there and he says, And yea, Dallas, I count all things but loss. He's not saying I'm better. He's saying whatever you have to brag about, whatever things in your life that you think you have, Paul says, listen, God's been good to me. I've got far better, but it's all for nothing except that I know Jesus Christ. Wearsby said, like most religious people today, Paul had enough morality to keep him out of trouble, but not enough righteousness to get him into heaven. It was not bad things that kept Paul away from Jesus. It was good things. And he had to lose his quote-unquote religion to find salvation. In Luke chapter 14 Jesus asked this question, For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily after he had laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that behold it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. So how does that apply to this and us today? How many here want to build upon what Jesus Christ has done for you? You got saved. And you want to better your life as a Christian. You want to raise your family in church. You want a strong marriage and children who obey the Lord. Hey, you, want your, you don't just want your body to be present in church. You want your life to honor God seven days a week. You want so much, but how many of us sit down and count the costs, as Jesus said? What's it going to take to build that life? And he says that when a man doesn't even consider the cost, when he builds a tower, he builds a foundation, he starts getting things up, he runs out of money, and then everybody mocks him saying, ha, look what he started and didn't finish. How many Christians started well? But they didn't know it was going to cost them something. I've said recently, and I'll say again, I thank God for our children, our children serving the Lord, and I, I'm not a perfect parent, trust me. But it's cost us some things to try to raise children the way we have. It's cost us some things. But we sat down and counted the cost a long time ago. And we said whatever it's going to cost, it is worth it if they'll stay faithful to God. Amen. How many parents started on the path and something got them off the path? Yep. They threw in the towel. How many are willing to sit down as Paul did and count the cost? Unfortunately, too little are willing. That's why Christians fall by the wayside. And that's why this world mocks Christianity. We start the work, but we don't finish because of circumstance or somebody or something that steals our heart away from God. So let us begin with Paul in chapter 3 to count the cost. Paul said, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. We usually like to put a period there, but there's a comma there. He's continuing the thought, and be found in him. I don't just want to win him, I want to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And notice there's a colon there. The thought is continuing. And he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, uh, sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. In other words, when I stand before him face to face in the day of resurrection, I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Paul, next week, well, two weeks from now, 
we'll begin to look at his past and we'll compare some of the things of his past to maybe our past. I wonder, what is it that's in the past, something in the past that you're holding on to that stole your joy? We're going to begin with there next time. This was all introduction <laughs> in the chapter 3. Things. Would you pray with me tonight? Lord, we thank you for your word and Lord, how precious it is. And God, we thank you that we have the opportunity to read within it and to find comfort and help in times of need. And Lord, maybe as we begin this study through chapter 3, maybe there's something that's drawn us away from you. Maybe there's something that's caused us to lose our heart for God. Maybe there's something that we're holding on to. Maybe it's not a possession. Maybe it's an event. Maybe it's a victory. Maybe it's a failure. But whatever it is, God, help us to surrender it to you tonight. God, I pray you take these things and help, them, help us to count them all but lost that we might win your heart, that we might know you, that we might serve you, and that you might find us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight as the piano plays, I wonder, has there been something that's stealing your joy tonight? As we were studying through the book of Philippians, it hasn't been a circumstance, it hasn't been a person, but it's something. Maybe it has been. possession that's drawing you away from God. Maybe it is a job or maybe it is a circumstance. Maybe it is a person. Hey, can we learn to bring these things to God? Can we learn to have the single mind and the submissive mind and as we begin to dive into chapter 3 learn about the spiritual mind that we might have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, that we might have it in us that our joy might be full. God wants to help us in these things, but will we allow Him? Piano's playing, but how's God working in your heart? Are you weren't willing to turn this thing over to God? Maybe it's been, as we illustrated, something you've prayed for. And what you thought was an answer to prayer was the very thing that has drawn you away from Christ. Wherever you're at tonight, would you allow God to help you in that very thing? To get close to Him once again. To walk with Him. To know Him. Notice Paul said to know Him and the fellowship of His sufferings. After all that Christ suffered for us, if I have to suffer something for Him, as we ask Sunday morning, is it too much? Is it too much? Or am I willing to do that for my Lord and Savior?